Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is part four of our four part series looking at Procter & Gamble. In the first video, we calculated a WAC of 4.2%. In the second video, we forecasted revenue going from 71 billion in 2020 to 97 billion in 2030. And in part three, we took a look at margins and have them slightly increasing from 49.7% to 50.3% from 2020 to 2030, which can all be seen here. And then the revenue piece can be seen here. Now, in this video, we're going to pull it all together and we're going to walk through this DCF and come to evaluation. So let's jump in and talk through the last few assumptions we need to make. First is around R&D, advertising, and SG&A costs. These can historically be seen, historically, these can be seen as not changing much and they've stayed pretty steady through the years. So we can see going from 2.9 to 2.6, 10.9 to 10.3, 10 10.5 to 11%. So we're actually gonna just go ahead and hold these constant at the 2020 levels for the remainder of the model. The next thing we wanna look at is CapEx and depreciation. And it looks like CapEx dipped slightly as a percentage of revenue in 2020, but it looks like historically it's been around 5%. So we're actually gonna go ahead and bump this back up to 5%. My guess here, is in 2020, they cut CapEx due to COVID as kind of a cost-cutting and precautionary measure. And because of that, we can actually see depreciation shot up in 2020 as a percentage of CapEx, meaning they probably didn't perform growth CapEx this year. So we'll go ahead and have that going back down to 80%, which is a healthy mix of growth and maintenance CapEx. Last thing we need to look at is working capital. I always set this equal to the previous year if we look at the working capital turns, the reason being is I don't want my DCF valuation to be dependent on how much cash can be generated from the operational choices. What I mean by this is if you look at like AR days or AP days, so basically, you know, the terms for your accounts receivable and your accounts payable, the larger you are, the better terms you can have. And you can generate cash flow from kind of owing money to some people, but collecting from others. Now, I don't want this to be a material driver for the company. And if it is an evaluation you're doing, that might be a red flag if they're not generating cash from anywhere else. So by holding it constant, we really minimize the impact here to the total cash flows. Now let's go ahead and actually look at the cash flow assumptions and you know see how it's growing from 2020 to 2030. So we have it going from 15 billion up to about 16 billion. And we'll see it actually dips down for a while here. The main driver here, right, is we have margins increasing, we're holding all their costs constant, and then we have our sales growth declining. But I think that this is pretty much to be expected from a company this size with this kind of strength of revenue historically. We'll kind of continue to see cash flows just slowly bump up, but nothing crazy. Now, if we switch over to our to the right here and we look at our valuation, if we use a 4.2% WAC, which is what we calculated in our first video, a terminal growth rate of 1.5%. Now, if you've watched my other videos, you'll know we normally hold this at about 3%. However, with the last year of revenue growth only being 2.4%, this is a pretty big company in a pretty saturated market that's not exactly growing tremendously. So I think this calls for a lower terminal growth rate there. And you can see with these assumptions, we actually get a valuation of $494 billion. This would lead us to believe that the company is actually undervalued. We know their current market cap is around 330 billion. So this would actually be a pretty significant discount currently. Now, the problem I have with this valuation and using this WAC is I tend to believe that we should use a WAC or a discount rate of what we actually require as a return as an investor. And if we only really needed a 4.2% return to be happy as an investor, well, personally, I would not invest in Procter & Gamble. I would want a much higher return than what that has to offer. So personally for myself, I would want something, you know, a company this big is less risky than the broader S&P 500. There is no doubt about that. So I would take kind of the broader return of the S&P 500 and probably want to shave off a percentage or two to get to what I would need as a weighted average cost of capital or for a return. So based off that, I would say somewhere from a seven, six to 7% is probably the return I would require. And if we actually look at our sensitivity table here, if we use a 6% WAC, 
you can see we actually get a valuation range of about 250 to 300 billion, just depending on how you change the perpetuity growth. So with a valuation of this sense, you know, they actually are a little bit overvalued currently at 330 billion, which I think kind of makes sense. We're in an environment where it seems all assets are slightly overvalued, and that's probably due to lower rates and people using lower discount rates and requiring lower returns. But at the same point, I don't think it's aggressively overvalued as some of the companies we've looked at. I think, you know, this is a pretty healthy, strong company with a lot of great brands, but just slightly overpriced at its current valuation. I think if this stock dropped down into the $250 range and nothing material changed to the business, this might actually be a pretty good or interesting opportunity to consider more and do a little bit more of an analysis on. So as always, thanks for watching the video. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. And one last thing I'd like to know is I do link the model for download in the description. So please feel free to go ahead and download that model and come in here and tweak any of the assumptions as you feel necessary and see what kind of valuation you get. So thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you found this useful and look forward to next time.